And good afternoon and welcome to today's Capital One Listening and Leading webinar. We are pleased to offer a discussion on bracing for impact strategies for supporting and hosting events in winter and spring, part one for the NCA Division One members. Uh, this is part two of our discussion with uh, uh, D1 leaders in roles in, in, uh, from SWA, uh, student athlete wellness and athletic training, athletic communications, event and game management, marketing, video, and development. Last week, we addressed this topic with our college division leaders. Uh, for today, please welcome our presenters. Uh, Kenny Boyd is the Senior AD of student, at, student Athlete Health and Wellness at Baylor. Uh, Clint Berge is from Utah State. He's the Associate AD for Communications and Marketing. Julie Cribs is from LSU. She is the Director of Game and Event Management. Jessica Hammond-Graff is from UMBC. She is the Deputy AD and Senior Women Administrator. And Eddie Acapinti from Monmouth. He is the Associate AD of Marketing and Sponsorship. Uh, before we begin, uh, we would like to uh, say a quick thank you to our corporate partner, Capital One, the presenting sponsor of Cositis Continuing Ed Series. And as a reminder, the on-demand webinar uh, will be posted later today on Cosida.com and Cosida's YouTube channel. Uh, we will also have this as a podcast, and you'll be able to download it from the uh, listed services on cosida.com. Uh, please invite your colleagues to listen and watch the on-demand webinar, uh, as it's free to everyone. Uh, thank you to all who have submitted questions in advance. Uh, we encourage you to submit any questions you might have and uh, place your questions in the chat box, and uh, your questions will be answered throughout the webinar. So obviously a lot to, to cover today, and I think the best way to start this as we kind of brace for impact is talk a little bit about mental health um, for not only just ourselves, but our staffs and our student athletes. Um, and Kenny, I'll start this one out for you. Uh, the mental health and emotional fatigue of living in COVID-19 uh, with all the interruptions and uncertainties is wearing on everyone, student athletes, coaches, and all of our staff members. Uh, can you talk about how you're dealing with the issues of mental health as it pertains to your department and everyone in it, and particularly your, your thoughts on how to help your staff members cope with the uncertainties and stresses? Well, this is a very important topic. I mean, in, in general, it, this certainly is an area that we want to focus in on with our student athletes. But what we're seeing play out over the last eight months uh, has been something that's been as critical from a staff development and support standpoint. So uh, when we, we had our athletes come back on campus, um, a lot of planning was put around uh, and strategies around uh, how we're going to support them. And you know, screening was a part of that. You know, we basically screened all 530 or so of our athletes as they came back in. And throughout the semester, we've noticed this growing trend that's that's mirrored on campus where there's been an increase in, in anxiety, depression, um, suicidal ideation, eating disorders. Um, and, and quite honestly, that also is mirrored in with, the, with some of our staff and our faculty um, that you're experiencing a, a lot higher um, incidents of mental health concerns. And uh, so we've had to kind of pivot um, some of the things that we've done as far as bringing attention to our staff, not only in, in how we are supporting them, but how we're educating them. So uh, one of the things that our, our mental health uh, uh, services group uh, internally in athletics have done has put together um, uh, little seminars, um, so to speak, and, and provide some education uh, around not only recognition of um, people that might be dealing with um, concerns of, of anxiety or depression uh, or suicidal ideation, things of that nature, but then also how do you respond? Uh, there are internal systems within our, our campus that help support that. And we need to make sure we're separating that from how we're responding in athletics to our student athletes, to how we uh, as members of an institution and campus um, partners are, are, are providing those resources. Jessica, talk a little bit about from your side as a deputy athletic director in SWA, you're wearing many hats right now. Probably, you know, if we were in the normal world, you'd be in basketball season, getting ready for your other winter sports to, to start. But I think now in this COVID world, everyone's doing different things. What's going on in your campus? How are you guys handling the mental health, but also, you know, getting those student athletes and not just them, but your, your other staff members to kind of to be a little bit at ease? Yeah, you know, I, I think at, at UMBC, we 
our president may was very clear that he values the people the people at umbc come first and so i think there was a lot of angst when you started seeing a lot of furloughs right you saw a lot of people laying off and, and people becoming nervous like I'm not working as hard right now because my responsibilities aren't um, as prevalent as they normally are during a traditional year, like ticketing, right? Like our, our ticketing people. And so finding ways to engage them in the department and to keep them active, to keep them engaged. You know, we've had some people chip in in a variety of roles um, to offer that support um, and ensure them that you are a valued member of our community and we, we want you with us. And so that's some of the ways that we've tried to ease tensions and you know relax minds about what the what the future holds for for our staff you know the other thing is important is just what we call holding space like creating opportunities for people to connect not only are we you know in a pandemic but there's also the resurgence of the black lives matter movement and how all of that intersects and creating opportunities to have those conversations and you know in the past it would be a walk in the hallway and you'd see somebody and you talk things through but now you have to be really more intentional about what does that look like and how can we just connect as individuals and um and come together in ways that we hadn't thought about previously now, let me ask you this question. Obviously, being at a state school is it, obviously a lot different than being at a private school. Have you seen a lot more red flags when obviously trying to prepare for the season? You know, you're obviously having to deal with the state and, and you know, kind of figuring out how each state is different. And I know with, within your league, the way you guys are putting your schedules together, but has that kind of been a bit of a challenge as well? Well, we were pretty clear with our teams up front, even before we had canceled the fall sports, we had said, okay, let's reconfigure our preseason games. Let's bring it all in state. We don't know what's going to happen. So if, if we can keep it in state, then we can ideally, I don't want to say guarantee, right? You can't guarantee anything during COVID, but it improves our chances to, to have um, some competitions before conference. And, and that got put to the wayside for the fall, but we took that same philosophy with our our basketball teams and with our teams in the spring let's keep it let's keep it local let's do the best we can and to really ensure that we can have some control and and it has been truly a partnership with our campus you know we have the the governor's um the governor level uh of policies we have the system policies we have a campus policies and so really how are all of those intersecting and it really takes the communication and us being clear with you know this is our plan and this is how we want to move forward while recognizing all these other stipulations um, that campus and local government has put on us yeah julie let me let, let me ask you this question so we, we just talked about mental health and how everyone's you know feeling a little bit different but i and I think I feel this sometimes as well, but from a staff member, those expectations have got to be tough. How are you handling expectations, not only, you know, from handling game management, but but handling stadiums and facilities? How are you handling that, um, knowing that everything could change on a daily basis? So, you know, it's a good question, especially with your facility staff. It's a group that never stopped. Um, like we've talked a little bit about, you know, being disconnected and being on Zooms and those things, those are those are people that, you know, had to be here and had to clean areas, um, you know, kind of not knowing can people be allowed in their offices. I mean, we are coming off a national championship. Do you think our football coaches don't want to be in their office as much as they can? Um, you know, and at that beginning time when the guidelines weren't quite in place, nobody quite knew what was going on. You know, those are those are hourly employees, you know, that that aren't getting paid a lot to do a job, you know, that isn't, you know, as flattering as, as other things. So encouraging them and making them feel safe, like, like Jessica said, just, you know, em empowering those people to know that we care about them. We want them to be safe. If there's something going on at home, you know, um, they have a child that's, um, you know, maybe in a situation that they don't want to bring something home to, or they live with an elderly parent, whatever it may be. So I think it was really important in the beginning for us to make sure that our senior level staff and our senior ADs and so on understood that we're going to do the best we can, but we got to really take care of those people and protect them to begin with. We didn't know what it was. Then moving, you know, a little bit later on <clears throat> as we grew through this, um, just retaining staff, um, you know, when unemployment things were happening, how do we keep those staff here? How are we paying them? How are we keeping them, you know, motivated to come work for us and stay here? So I think we managed through a lot of that and, and then going into our, 
groups. Um, we use landmark event staffing for ourselves. So um, we were dealing with their mental um, capacities of what was going on for them and, and being nervous about the future of, of what was happening there. So I think a lot of that was communication um, and just trying to be as transparent as we could with all those different groups. I have, to, I have to ask the question. I know it's a little bit off on this, but how's the tiger doing? Has he, you know, <laughs> you ha usually on a Saturday, you've got you know over a hundred thousand fans wanting to get near the tiger cage. And has that changed how you guys are handling that as well? Like you know, take out just the the human side of it, but you do have a live mascot on your campus. Yeah, it's it's something you know you wouldn't really think about, but it was interesting when we when we did come back to campus and and we have barricaded our our habitat um, so people aren't getting close to them. I mean, you just don't know what it is. Um, and you don't want to run that risk, but it, it was interesting to, um, you know, the campus is kind of a ghost town, but but people still wanted to get out. And Louisiana is definitely not a place that people stay indoors, especially in the spring. So not having, you know, baseball season and, and those things that they're used to, um, they just wanted to be outside. And so it was, you know, understanding that and, and letting certain things happen that need to happen, but but also protecting the people that were here working and and you know the tiger is one of those one of those individuals but uh yeah it was, it was it was just different when you came back and saw stuff like that yeah eddie obviously i don't think you have a live hawk in jersey but how are you guys ex how are you handling those expectations when it comes to coaches you're you're in a different side you're on the marketing sponsorship but also you handle a lot of the video broadcasts is that is that kind of been a little bit tougher where you haven't had any live games so you're kind of you know trying to you know pull in the well and find some you know, games on demand to, to kind of get your, your, your marketing and sponsorship deals taken care of? Yeah, you know, I think the, the big challenge was to, to kind of aid our coaches in their recruiting efforts at a time where they couldn't uh, leave, right? They, had, they were home, they couldn't go out and they couldn't recruit. So what we try to do is as best we can support, uh, obviously not just the mission of the university, but, but what all of our coaches are trying to do. So a lot of the content that we'll try to put out uh, is very intentional. It's going to have a goal and a meaning behind it. And I collaborate daily with our sports information staff. I started off in this business as a sports information professional. So um, my relationship with them and, and appreciation for what they do it goes far beyond just what you see kind of put out. So we, we all sat down and were very honest with what we wanted to accomplish. We understand and want to be aware of what our community is facing, you know, at the time when all this began, the Northeast, especially New Jersey, um, not so much where Monmouth is, but about an hour north of here. It, it was kind of the epicenter and, uh, you know, obviously being so close to New York City. So it, it was that fine line between wanting to stay relevant, wanting to stay on your on your fans' radar and, and on your community's radar while also being sympathetic to what everyone was going through. You know, I, I think it'd be irresponsible to, while people are uh, battling for their jobs, their health, you know, for us to say things uh, you know, that are just so kind of blindly pro Mammoth. I, I mean, I'm a branding guy. I would love that. But I think we, we tried to kind of strike that balance between staying engaged, staying relevant, while also understanding what's going on. And now as this has shifted uh, now to where I think the appetite is all of our fans, and we didn't play fall sports either, uh, they want content. So then it turned into the conversations where it, it was with our coaches, with our student athletes, and it just try to keep people interested and aware with what's going on with our brand while uh, while we were not competing, which we're very hopeful for a basketball season uh, in the next few weeks. Clint, piggyback off that a little bit from a sports information side, how are you handling those expectations with not only your coaches, but within your staff and, and you know, maybe even some of the upper administration? Well, I, I think, um, you know, one thing we were concerned with is staying relevant, right? Making sure that uh, the, the vice president and the president knew that we were doing had stuff to do but you know people kept saying you know they don't understand the sports information world they say well what are you guys doing then and i said there's a million things we can be doing so um i always made sure to, that people knew there was plenty to do uh, i made sure to show people what we were doing uh, we did a lot of uh, things like the, i think a lot of schools did this like the throwback uh, type things uh through social and on our website we actually took our homecoming week was supposed to be our homecoming week we don't have football um, so we, our homecoming week surrounds men's soccer and our homecoming week with everything canceled, we, what we did is we went back and found some big games from the past and we put those out, complete games on Facebook and YouTube, hoping to get, you know, some, some interaction with those. Um, I wouldn't say they did great, but it was something and it's content that we provided and, and, and hopefully people kind of caught on to that. But yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's been interesting. 
Now, obviously, you, you wear multiple hats at uh, Utah Valley. From, from your marketing side, have you seen much of a change or have you seen some issues where, you know, some of the sponsors may have pulled back a little bit or, or asking for different things in return since there are no live games happening? Yeah, we're, we're trying to, you know, kind of figure that out now, too. Um, we did lose some sponsors that we were used to having. Um, we're trying to attach more to social media. Um, like, uh, for example, we've got one company who wants to sponsor our post-game celebrations in the locker room. Those are big videos, right? So um, we're trying to get creative with that. I've, I've, everybody's talked about, you know, upping the, uh, the broadcast. We've made sure to, to make sure our, our corporate guys know that push that broadcast. We have plenty of real estate on our broadcast to, to put graphics and put, you know, readers and things like that. So that's one of the biggest things for us is pushing that broadcast piece and, and, and allowing corporate people to kind of get involved that way. Yeah, that's great. So this is another interesting thing that was talked about on part one of our Bracing for Impact, which was with the college division uh, leaders. And it was a great, it was a, it was a great, you know, line of prepare, but not plan. Julie, talk a little bit about that in the sense, you got to prepare for everything. You've got a game on Saturday, you've got, you know, you've got net TV coming in, you know, how are you handling that? But also, it could be Friday and everything gets shut down. How, how have you guys internally worked on that? Yeah, it's it's super interesting. We're, we've been in all those situations here at LSU, um, you know, between having a game canceled, um, not knowing when our next game will be, um, anticipating, you know, we could have a game this Saturday. We don't know. So I, I think that, that that we heard the other day about preparing, not necessarily planning. Um, when you're event planners, it's a little tough because, you know, our job is so far out in advance. So, you know, we look at football season as the day after our last game, the next season starts. And so this has been quite the challenge, I think, for event managers and facility managers um, because we're used to having a different, a different timeline, I guess, if you will. And, you know, I think looking at things of, you know, what does hospitality really look like now? Um, what do uh, venue rentals look like? Things that, you know, we're a spend money kind of department. And when we had venue rentals, tours, you know, a lot of um, universities that have that, especially at the division one level that can do those things have lost a lot of that revenue that, that people have kind of forgotten about is, as far as ticket revenue is always up there high. Um, so, you know, I think just, you know, Zoom obviously has become a huge asset to us. Um, we've tried to look at the positive sides of it because we can get a lot more people in the room um, through a Zoom and we can engage and, and people are understanding how to do it better. Um, but, you know, at the, at the same time we've realized, um, so for example, with us, when we do our uh, weekly game op Zoom that might have 80 people on it, they're very engaged. We have a really good agenda. We've figured out how to do a lot of good things on it. Um, and then when we have a, um, parking traffic police kind of outside entities you kind of notice nobody has their camera on you're not really sure if they're engaged so you start kind of understanding how you might need to format things differently um, for different groups so um, but I, I think it's all you know we look at what are those opportunities in the middle of all this chaos I mean there's some things that we've really been able to change and actually make better um, from a security standpoint a staffing standpoint um, it, you know what we've done but at the same time um, I think you could ask anybody, especially on the facility side, they probably worked harder for 20,000 people than we work for 100,000 people, um, just with the sheer amount of signage and setup and, you know, cleaning and everything we've had to do. Um, it, it was quite a feat for, for the first game. Jessica, here's an interesting one for you with, within that preparing but not planning. You guys, for your, your arena, is, is not owned by your university. It's run by a third party. Has that been a bit, has that been kind of tough when it comes to, okay, men's basketball will usually practice at 12, but maybe they can't get into one now because either there's cleaning going on or you have some other, you know, other sports happening. Has that been an issue you guys have had to kind of, kind of deal with a little bit as well? No, I feel actually really blessed to have been partnered with the OQ group. Um, they've been great to work with. Um, we haven't had to displace our teams too much. Like one of the benefits for us was they didn't have a lot of events going on this year. So we could leave down our competition court and our practice gym. And so we could, you know, while the t one team was on this, we were cleaning this space and then they could rotate. And so it just made things a lot easier um, to manage with that partnership. And as we're 
you know, ramping up for basketball games, really relying on them. Okay, what's your policy? How, what's your process to put everything in place to ensure that we can get off the ground? So we've really worked together to ensure a, a, as best to start as we can um, to not plan too far in advance, but you know, to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. But because we have volleyball and um, men's and women's basketball in this arena and trying to get everybody through the practices, it really just made things so much easier to have both those floors down um, to be able to practice and keep the times that the coaches want and they normally do and the times that the athletes are used to so we could build class schedules around them. So it was actually, I feel blessed in that way. Yeah, I think, and Kenny talking about the preparing part, but one of the things that, you know, your department handles a lot within student health and wellness is the testing. And I know we haven't talked about how that's how that's going to start taking place. But as we start seeing and getting back into games, the testing protocol is going to be super important, whether it's, you know, are you are you staffing folks at the door? You know, how is that running through your office? Is, does, does the sports information folks have to be involved with that? Talk a little bit about what you've done at Baylor and, and maybe what some of the things you've seen. And then I'm going to come back to you after that one with the well, what if there's a positive a positive for testing obviously that was a loaded question um <laughs> yeah i think i've started every meeting with our staff since march with um the fact that you know anything i'm about to say is subject to change i kind of feel like the weatherman sometimes where you um are guaranteeing that there's some some change is going to happen and it might not be 100 percent accurate um you know i think also just the notion that there is no expert in COVID-19. Uh, we're developing experts right now. And so, um, you know, being transparent to the fact that this is this is what we think is the best way to do it, um, but fully acknowledge that, you know, as we start to get more information, this might change. It's happening with basketball right now. Uh, between our fall sports and what we've done, we've learned a lot. And so we're using that strategy to try to help, um, you know, advantage a, a sport that's somewhat more difficult to think about an indoor sport, uh, close contact, um, you know, what is the risk there? And so, you know, testing is a way to monitor the process. And I think we're incorporating different types of testing, different strategies, even within, you know, the conferences. It seems like there's a little bit of a different nuance in how we're doing testing to, to monitor that. Um, you know, I think in general, as we were trying to develop our protocols around this within the Big 12 conference and then within other medical groups, a lot of it was focused in on what do we currently have and 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 not to overextend ourselves, but we're starting to get to the point where we can be a little bit more aggressive on some of our testing strategies because our supply chain has, has been at least a little bit supported. Now, we're moving into a concern now with this, this third wave um, that we're seeing across the country of kind of going back to some strategies that we've, we were using in the, in the early part of this uh, to be a, a smarter about our surveillance testing program, uh, smarter about how we're bringing our student athletes and staff back on campus or planning to bring them back on campus in January. So I think a lot of that's um, really been impacting how we've set up our protocols moving forward. And then what happens if you have either a staff member or, or you know, and, and Julie, I'll, I'll come to you next on this, but a, an event worker or, you know, a freelance uh, person test positive. What are you, what are your, uh, what are your plans for that? Yeah. You just hope you're at home, right? You hope you're not traveling on the road and trying to, trying to figure that out. We were scratching our heads for the longest time and, you know, we've done some things uh, uh, within, you know, you know, within our conference and institution, uh, to help set up some strategies for at-home concerns versus on the road. But the easy one is, is at home. And this is where we leverage our relationships with um, campus and, and stay in alignment with them. But, you know, our isolation and quarantine uh, spaces for our student athletes um, are shared with campus. I mean, or we are sharing with campus. Um, what happens with that information is, you know, we're also needing to be in alignment with those policies. So, um, you know, we do have different capacity of testing and monitoring than the general student population. So we've got to be very careful that we're not overextending ourselves or setting up our athletes, our student athletes with expectations that might be different than what the general student body population is experiencing. For our staff, a lot of this is working with human resources, um, you know, our, our environmental health and safety uh, director on campus and uh, emergency management group 
I mean, we're all on a call together on a weekly basis, talking through some of these things that we're seeing. And what we've done internally is set up our own infection response team. And it has representatives from campus and all those areas to be able to share because we might be seeing positives, not just from student athletes, but from, like you said, from, from operation staff or just, you know, regular departmental staff. And so there are people on campus that are taking some of the contact tracing um, or the messaging, uh, you know, from us so that we don't have to worry about doing all that ourselves. And that's, I think, one of the biggest lessons we learned is, you know, the ability to um, lean on those other resources so that you're not carrying the whole weight of what you're having to do from an athletic department standpoint. Um, and I think in some ways we have to retrain our staff to think that way because for so long we've worked in this independent model where we've got everything set up and we can handle it all. But now we're kind of reaching across the aisle or the street to, um, to campus to get their support. And that's, that's caused us to have to do some re-education um, from some policies and what we're doing as well. That's awesome. That, that's great information right there. Julie, talk about, so you're on a different side of this, obviously. You're dealing with more third-party outside folks. Like you said earlier, you're, you know, within your operations conversation, it may be, you know, a local police officer or, you know, a, a food vendor. How are you going over with them the importance of, you know, are you doing testing, you know, online testing from home? Do they have to bring a, you know, bring a, a, a negative uh, sheet with them that, that, that they would get if they, take, they took a test? What are you guys doing? So I think this goes back to just what you're saying. What 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 are you trying to plan, and then what's reality? And you know, for us, um, you know, even though we're in, you know, at the beginning, you're not quite sure how many fans you're going to have, and how many concession stands I need to open, and what's my footprint going to look like, and how many police officers need. So I think as we were trying to really understand that, and you know, as um, restrictions changed, it felt like constantly they're leading up to our first game um, was figuring out what that staffing plan would look like. And we kind of always looked at it as, you know, let's just prepare for 100,000 and know it's not going to be there, but we can back away as we need. Um, and I, I think that's where we really had to narrow down um, and understand better. You know, we aren't medical professionals. We don't like Kenny said, nobody is a professional in this. So how are we going to understand who really needs to be tested? What does that mean? Who can get the you know, who should be getting the 72 hour test versus the day of tests. And, and I think we, we tried, you know, at the beginning, you know, we were going to work in these pods and you'd work from home these days and whatever. And then reality just set in like everybody, it's all hands on deck and everybody was here helping us as much as they could. And when it comes to those, you know, vendors, third party staffing companies, um, law enforcement, all of the groups that we need to, to make it, to make it work in the footprint that we were looking at. And, and I think that's what people really need to understand is that, you know, when you're talking about a stadium that that seats 100,000, you can't just close off your upper decks, um, you know, and say, well, we'll just close those off so we don't have to staff them and save a little money because you close that off, you lose 20,000 seats, 25% of that, you know, it's all, you know, that little bit of money matters all the way down. So for us, we actually had to increase our footprint of our stadium um, in order to get to a capacity um, that we felt like would make sense to sell tickets and to offset costs and so on. Um, and then with that being said, there is a fiscal responsibility to testing um, that we really had to look at. And I think that's where, you know, in, on my operations side, the credentialing part of it and people understanding, you know, who needed credentials where, you know, and, and really seeing what is tier one. So in the SEC, we do a tier one, tier two, tier three and, and system that really helped us. And it helped the football program know who can be in the bench, who can be in the locker room versus who can be on the field. Um, and, and I think we're seeing that moving into basketball as well. Um, while the same, you know, groups from marketing or, you know, wherever might work basketball games, um, it's kind of understanding, am I going to test my GA because she is kind of my shadow or does she really need to be tested? So I think we're really working through a lot of, you know, that with our testing protocol and what, what makes the most sense. And when you look at a basketball arena, um, you know, for us, it's 13,000 seats. It doesn't matter if our governor said we're, we can be 100% capacity. As long as we still have that six foot distancing, you know, then those mandates, we can't get past 18, 19% of our, of our basketball arena. So, so I think all of that is just, you know, we're so far along and, and obviously we've learned things in the last nine months that none of us ever thought we would ever need to know. But um, from a testing protocol too, for staff, it was understanding with these large staffs, like 
again, what is the reality of them doing their own self-assessment type checks? Um, we do temperature screens still. Everybody that, that comes in our venues, um, you know, is, is that good or bad? Is it optics and things like that? Yeah, maybe. But um, at the same time, we want to make sure that, that we're doing what we can. But I think the PPE and things like that are the most important. Um, we have had concession workers say, I'm not going to wear it. I refuse to this or, or, or fans that do the same, obviously. Um, and we've had to deal with quite a few of those type of issues as well. Eddie, talk a little bit about it from a different side. You're on the marketing side, but also on the broadcast side, you you know, employ a lot of students and, you know, how has that conversation started with them where you didn't have football. So a lot of the kids that were, you know, ready from last season to kind of get going may have to sit and you may not be able to use all of those kids. You know, how's that, how's that conversation gone over at Monmouth? Yeah. You know, I know so many of us uh, at the mid-major level, especially rely on, you know, a multitude of people to make things happen, whether it's, interns, undergraduate students, graduate students, you know, part-time workers like we've talked about with some of the other, you know, concerns here. And, you know, we didn't have a fall season, so our basketball planning started fairly early, and now it's come more into focus over the last couple of, of weeks. Who fits into what tiers? And, you know, we had to have some pretty honest conversations uh, where we put on our own ESPN 3 and Plus broadcast at Monmouth as one of those school-produced universities. So, you know, there's a lot of students that, that are paying tuition to come to Monmouth to study, you know, communication and broadcast. So being aware and cognizant of that while also uh, trying to have those honest conversations and say, um, I think similar to what Julie was saying, you know, does this student need to be a tier two or even tier one where they're going to be tested a certain amount of time? And, and for us to, you know, collaborate as both a broadcast unit with our sports information folks, with our facilities people, and just make certain decisions where, you know what, we don't need a camera in this position like normal because that would require an undergraduate student, um, you know, to be tested three times a week. So it, it's been also working in collaboration with our ESPN contacts within the MAC, within our league to, to see what's a minimum number of cameras that we need to put these broadcasts on. What true staff do we need where in the past you could staff one, two, three people, maybe even a shadow uh, on something like an audio or like a technical director, where now, um, you know, because of physical distancing, because of all the other mandates, uh, it really has kind of boiled it down to what's the bare bones minimum staff that you need to put a broadcast on while kind of walking that fine line with still wanting to give our students the experience or as close to the experience that we can and putting on a great product. So you're kind of aware of all of those different things at the same time where you can't exclude students just because of certain things, but you also uh, can't have the normal staff that you would, you know, a basketball broadcast that would be 10 or 12 cameras now has to be down in the six to eight range, which, uh, you know, I know our folks on the production side are kind of struggling with how we get certain shots and things like that. Um, you know, we won't necessarily have the concern with linear television coming in as much as we'll kind of be tasked with putting on uh, I believe it'll be 10 uh, broadcast dates between our men and women with basketball. So, you know, it's been it's been a tough conversation because the students want to be involved. But we also, I think, would have a hard time going to a parent and saying, yeah, your student's going to be tested three times a week because we need to bring these games to them. So it's been an interesting, I think, kind of balance between us, the academic side, and also uh, the operations side as well. Yeah, I think, you know, another thing, and, and uh, Jessica, for you here, the uncertainties, obviously, of everything, whether it's, you know, you're dealing with 18 to 21 year olds who, you know, they want to have their lives as well. And I'm sure between yourself and your athletic director, you guys, you know, are, are staying up at night for other reasons now, but you know, they just want to be, they want to be kids. They want to be able to hang out with their friends if they're in the dorms, you know, has that conversation been from your staff of, Hey, you know, you, you're here to do a job essentially and be a student athlete and you don't want to get yourselves, you know, sick where it, maybe in the past it was, you don't want to go out to the bars and stuff like that. Has that been a conversation you guys have had to have with them about, you know, staying distant from each other and, you know, understanding that there is a task at hand still? Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, it really started with educating our coaches and saying this, this is what it's going to look like. And so we need your help to reiterate this to the student athletes. We didn't want anybody to come to campus and be surprised as to what it might look like, you know, what the responsibilities were, how limited in, in quote unquote isolated, you know, they might be. So we really started with educating our coaches to make sure they had a clear picture 
of what the expectations would be so then they could pass it along to the students. We had a couple town hall meetings with our student athletes over the summer. You know, we gave some student athletes the opportunity um, if you're an international student and you wanted to stay home, you know, kind of what does that look like for them? And we had some student athletes who opted not to return, you know, this semester. And then the students who, who did arrive, again, those team meetings reiterating. And what I kept stressing to the teams is, we the, the administration has done everything that we can do, right? We put together the plan, we've spoken to the right people, we have gotten you here. And how long we get to stay here and do this is really up to them. Um, and so really kind of working the plan and, and everything that we had put into place, you're, you're just trusting the student athletes to, to do that and to take ownership and responsibilities for their behaviors. And I'd love to sit here and say, all of our teams had this great linear progression and you know we made it to the end of the semester on skates. No, but teams, they kind of learned, they, there were some setbacks, other teams saw what other teams were doing and like, I don't want to be like them. And so, but, you know, overall, it, it, the responsibility was theirs and they understood that they could do this as long as like we were willing to do it as long as they were willing to do their part. And we ended, you know, we ended our seasons last week to give everybody the opportunity to, for a clean bill of health so they could celebrate Thanksgiving, um, you know, with family or minimize family gatherings, small groups. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you get the idea. Clint, talk about what you guys are doing over at Utah Valley. Obviously, you know, sorry, students. We love dogs. It's fine. We have tigers, we have dogs, we've got all animals here. Clint, your side of it from dealing with those uncertainties with the student athletes and, you know, them just wanting to be, you know, students at times, what is it, what has your office had to do in order to, you know, communicate to them and explain to them, you know, just like what Jessica said that, you know, the administration's done everything they could, you support sports medicine's done what they've could, you know, senior staff has done it. What, what about the communication side? Well, I, I'll say our sports medicine team, they, they all deserve raises after all they've dealt with for the past few months, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, like Jessica said, you know, we, we inform them, you know, what we need to say and, and we kind of leave it up to them. And, and also, like she said, we, I don't know that there's a team that didn't deal with a quarantine at, at some point or, or three or four quarantines at some point or another, or there may or may not be a couple teams in quarantine now. So it, it's, it's, I think us, the whack where the conference we're in deciding not to do any fall sports has been really good to kind of iron some of those things out, but it's been a learning experience for everybody. You know, for example, our women's basketball team, uh, they've dealt with a couple of quarantines and they've, uh, they pretty much all live together in, in two or three apartments. Um, so if one of them gets sick, then, then there's no way to, you know, not quarantine the rest of that crew that they live with. So um, it, it's really been a, a struggle to, to go through that, but it's been a good learning process. And I think we're ready uh, for when things start up, hopefully next weekend. Talk to me a little bit more uh, on, a, on a messaging side. How have you and your staff and, you know, you can even put your marketing hat on for, for this answer as well, but how have you dealt with the alumni and the media and, you know, that, that aunt that used to come to every game that she can't now that she's going to have to watch the game on ESPN3? How have you kind of put out your messaging for that? Um, we've been very big on social in terms of, um, you know, a lot of practice photos, a lot of practice videos. Um, just constant reminders of, you know, we're ready, we want to play, we want to be safe. Um, and then like I, in my initial answer right at the top, of, we're very concerned about putting together a good broadcast. Um, like Eddie talked about the broadcast side of things too. And, and we want to make sure that that's really um, something we've, you know, figured out, figured out well. Um, the WAC digital network, essentially what we do is we just take our Jumbotron feed from our arenas. And so, um, our biggest thing is, like Eddie said, I mean, who works, who, what camera operators can work, who gets tested, who doesn't. Um, but the messaging, you know, is, is we are going to do the very best we can to bring you whatever we can. We've had a couple of, of scrimmages, actually, our women's soccer team scrimmaged a couple of weeks ago, and our volleyball team is actually scrimmaging tomorrow themselves. And uh, I think the question we've gotten almost every day from the coaches and student athletes they even try to take it to the presidents. Are we going to be able to have fans? Um, and, and the answer, obviously, right now is no. Uh, but 
what we're trying to do as a staff in marketing and media relations and, you know, with our coaches is, is make sure that these, you know, kids and the parents know that we're going to do our very best to make sure they can see every second of everything they need to see, make sure they know their kids are still being covered um, in a marketing sense, you know, and in a, in a media relations sports information sense. What about from like your media members? Have you, have they reached out kind of figuring out, you know, what's the new lay of the land is, you know, are you going to have, you know, is everyone going to get credentialed? Are you going to, you know, only credential folks that come to every game? How's post game going to be handled? I'm sure those are a lot of questions that have gotten brought up. Yeah, as far as media goes, um, we'll credential most anyone who wants to come into the event. Uh, we've got an upper tier area. We're going to be putting all those media members. Um, so they won't be close to the core. They won't be close to anybody if, they, if that's what they choose. Um, one thing the WAX decided is we're going to do all of our post game via Zoom. Um, so we'll have a player and a coach after each game go into the media room. It'll just be, you know, those two and whoever's running the camp, the computer or camera in there. And we actually are going to use that to our advantage because we're, you know, we're kind of like fourth or fifth in the, in the pecking order here in the state of Utah. So we're going to, you know, tell all the media, hey, in 15 minutes, Mark Madsen's going to be on Zoom to talk about tonight's game. And I'm, we're hoping that that, you know, gets us a couple more, you know, hits here and there. So uh, we're going to do what we can to take advantage of some things like that. But uh, as far as, yeah, as far as media goes, we're, we're going to make sure they're distant enough that uh, that we still want them to come, but um, we've we got to be safe. So, Eddie, talk about that a little bit as well, what your plan is at Monmouth. But obviously, you know, you, you as the play-by-play -play guy for Monmouth, you have a little bit more of an insider's edge. What have you done to, you know, maybe help some of your fellow media members to feel like they're still a part of it? They may not be able to come to practice, but that they're still taken care of. Yeah, I think our situation is pretty unique because very few uh, universities, especially mid major universities, have their play-by-play -play person also kind of intimately involved in the planning process. So, um, and also doing some work within the MAC that I do, uh, having the ability to share what we're doing with the other 10 member institutions in the league has been helpful, where, like Clint was saying, from a, from a pure media standpoint, um, you know, everything is going to be done through Zoom, and, and it's going to take a a toll on our content as well. You know, after games, we would post press conference, we would go into our media room, we'd have a, a conversation with coach, we'd interview a player. And, you know, obviously, all that's going to change now. But I think that the key that we've tried to talk about is, uh, at least internally, not just making sure that we're kind of good with everything that's going on, and that we're putting out the best product, but trying to keep in mind every step of the way, which is, I feel it's good that we have a, a marketing component in those conversations where Everything that we do, we try to have at least that thought with what's being viewed on the other side of this. So whether it's social, whether it's broadcast, how is it being digested by, uh, you know, your key constituents, right? So your parents, your donors, the, the folks that support your university, and then just the general fans of the school and the league. So trying to have that in the back of the mind, wanting to be healthy while still wanting to follow all the state rules, while still getting people the access that they need. So we've been able to kind of assist with our development team and making sure that they can still have a great pregame experience, albeit remotely and, and virtually over Zoom. Same thing with postgame. Um, it, it's actually going to make for a pretty busy winter where instead of doing one thing that we can push out to a bunch of different audiences, now we're going to really specialize in, in, in a lot of the things, whether it's a five-minute delivery from our head coach in regards to uh, the upcoming opponent that we'll deliver and record on Zoom that we can post out there, or the actual broadcast, which like Clint said, and like I think a few of us have said, uh, really are going to become the best way this winter that we can deliver not just the athletic department messages, but whatever university messaging that you're allowed to work into that and kind of push that out, whether it's through interviews or through commercial inventory that you can use uh, for our sponsors as well. That's, you know, it's in my job title. And I'll tell you, it takes a large part of my time this time of year is making sure that all of those impressions that they miss throughout the fall and throughout winter, as far as being in person and having fans, because we will not have fans, uh, um, the, for this upcoming winter, you know, making sure that they're still getting a lot of that exposure. So when you tie kind of all that together, you know, still doing your job, doing it well, doing it with what your audience is kind of experiencing on their side, where, uh, for example, we won't have fake crowd noise at our games because you can tell that it's an arena that is empty. And I think that, you know, I think we want to be realistic and understand we're not the NFL on Fox. We're not the Big 12 or the SEC. So we can understand that uh, it's pretty likely that you can understand we're coming to you from a, from an empty arena, but not missing out on on maybe the experience. So still making sure 
that all of the content is there, that it's going to feel as close to normal as possible without kind of, I think, overextending ourselves and, and kind of being unrealistic with how we're delivering that. Yeah, I think that's that, that's a good point. You know, how everybody handles that in-game, you know, atmosphere is going to be important. Um, Kenny, I want to go back to you about something you were you travel with you with with you know Baylor football how are your coaches and your student athletes handling all this obviously we're talking about how to how to prepare but at the same time we still have to worry about how the student athletes and the coaches are are, are feeling towards all this have you gotten a lot of positive reviews about how not only your staff's handling this but you know throughout the NCAA and your conference well I, I think in some ways it's like our own kids they're they're more resilient than you think um you know they they can adapt and and you know, move forward. But, you know, as this continues to move forward, um, you are starting to see some time, some times where they just, they're just tired of having to adhere to all the protocols. Um, and, you know, it's the ones that have been really trying hard since the beginning are the ones you probably worry about the most. But, you know, our staff and, and coaches, um, they're experiencing the same thing. You know, I think we're very much a relational, um, you know, being. And so uh, existing virtually every day, um, is, is a challenge. And, and then when you go on the road and you have all these um, mitigating circumstances, and I think we're trying very hard to um, reduce the vulnerabilities that we have, um, you know, as we travel, but in essence, that isolates people, right? Um, you know, we're doing, doing strategies like, you know, meals, um, no longer having team meals together. You're, you're taking your food to your room. Uh, you know, you're doing meetings outside um, which is great, but it's not great if it's 30 degrees and you're in Ames, Iowa, you know, so, uh, um, you know, I, I think the challenge that we have now and, and we've had moving and we'll, we'll have moving forward is how do we how do we provide the um, relational ability to continue to let people connect um, and not in a face mask. And so you're, at, you're, you know, you're learning how to read eyes, but allowing people to express themselves um enjoy what it is to travel and compete and be a part of that experience uh but then still keep people safe and i said it earlier i think it's risk management it's it's looking at the vulnerabilities and assuming okay these are risks that we have to take we can't avoid this but you know what are we wearing on a plane on a bus you know can we spread people out on a bus is there a possibility that we're doing some you know interviews like we're doing them virtually uh, can we do some in person? You know, is, is there that opportunity to, when can we start doing that? So I think we'll still have to continue to look at it, but, you know, we're starting to see some of those signs of just people being really tired of having to continue to adhere to these protocols that are isolating them from each other. Now, we started this webinar talking about mental health, and, and one of the things you just hit on was not having team meals, and, and everyone can kind of you know, think about this one, but do you think that's affecting the student athletes at all from a mental health perspective or even the coaches where, you know, usually we've all sat as one team, we're sitting as a family, we're, we're you know, everyone has their table and now they're separated. Is that, have you seen that's affecting the student athletes at all? Well, I think where it really affects is, is the team togetherness, is that team chemistry that you build throughout the season um, that culminates hopefully into a championship run. And you just don't have those opportunities because we've, we're separating people. And so um, you take on top of that, you know, um, looking at Julie and Coach Aranda, uh, the former uh, Bayou Bingle, and, um, you know, he's coming in as a new coach into an environment. He had one month to get to know people. And, um, and then we went into to lockdown, you know, no spring ball. Uh, summer was completely different. You know, not only is it affecting the team chemistry and the players, but also within the staff and the coaches. And so, you know, trying to find ways to recreate or um, be innovative in how we're doing some things as far as team building and connecting staff um, and student athletes. So I think that's one thing that, you know, goes, goes unnoticed for all these programs that are dealing with brand new coaches, um, freshmen as they're coming in, how do they adapt to college life? Um, you know, international students for the first time in the United States and, and really are separated from home. All those challenges that we had early on are just at that much more accentuated and elevated in, in the concern. And so um, those are things that come to mind for me when we're uh, thinking about those challenges. 
Jason, I want to come back to you um, for a quick question, talking about expectations and stuff. Um, what, what, how is that working? You know, with you and your staff uh, at Utah Valley, with the expectations from coaches and and from administrators. Um, we we're trying to figure that out as we as we go, and I think we'll we'll have to you know make some changes as things go along. Um, but one thing we've talked about and. I don't know that it's something that's been really echoed to the the fall sports coaches, but when we're in the spring, we're going to have to, when we have two or three events going on at once, we're going to have to kind of uh, prioritize. And I think what we're going to do is prioritize this in season sport. Um, I think the student athletes are fortunate. Obviously they're fortunate that they can get that year back. Um, so that allows us to think, uh, try and be a little more um, decisive in, in the decisions we make as far as prioritizing goes. Um, and so we've we've kind of kept, kept the coaches, you know, this is we're going to do the best we can type thing. And uh, but as, as they all understand and they've all said they understand, um, they'll be fine with that. We we have noticed some things. So like I talked about before, the, the coaches and the student athletes so we're begging, you know, the president for uh, fans at games. We're trying to temper those expectations in, in that area a little bit. But um, we've certainly uh, talked to our coaching coaching staffs and our administration about tempering expectations overall. Last question before we uh, we end this, but if anyone has a question from our viewers, please send it into the chat and we will uh, we'll get to them uh, before we end our webinar here today. So uh, here's the last question. And I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to answer this one. Um, so what are the lessons learned so far through the COVID-19 hit and how can these lessons help you and our learners uh, and, our, and our listeners say, um, Kenny, we'll start with you. How can you know, some of the things you've learned kind of, you know, you, can you take with you and, 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 you know, keep continuing to learn even more about it? I, I mean, I, I spoke to it earlier. Um, you know, I think some of the, the things that we've, I've learned personally is just the power of, of relationship building and, and, you know, what that means for our success in times of, of struggle. I mean, you can have a, a team that you put together a strategy for emergency planning and, you know, a care team that we put together around our, our student athletes. And, um, but if you don't trust the people in that relationship, then you have a hard time uh, to really, um, you know, excel and, and execute that. And so, you know, it's forced me to do more um, to get out and, and be more in, in that mindset of building relationships, understanding that there's a million things going on. I have a Zoom call, I've got all these things to do. Um, a staff member comes comes by and, and, and mentions something to me. And, you know, I, I remember this from a mentor, my Tina Bonsi, is to remain fully present in those conversations and be aware when a passing conversation is a plea for help. Um, and so I think those are, you know, for me, it's it's uh, being a little bit more attuned to uh, to those things that, that might pop up from day to day uh, and not get too busy to not hear that. So. What about you, Jessica? I think similarly similarly to Kenny I would say it, it really just starts with good people it it you never know the the staff that you have until you're in a crisis and you're asking them to really push their boundaries of, of what you hired them to do and I strongly believe that you can do anything with good people and so this just really reiterated that um, for me and thinking back and thinking forward to hiring and who you look for and how you vet them. Like nobody said, oh, this person's gonna be really great in a pandemic, let me hire them, right? Like you don't, you don't think like that, <laughs> but you're asking people to do crazy things right now. And it really goes to that vetting process at the beginning of, of who are we hiring, who are we bringing into our family and, and knowing that there might be times where we're really stretching them to, and asking them to do these, these impossible things. So really driving home the point that, you know, hiring good people matters from the very, from day one. What are you, what's your thoughts on that, Eddie? Yeah, I think Jessica makes a great point. You know, if, if your office and department culture is strong and you hire great people to fit into that great culture, then when you ask them to do things they've never been asked to do or thought of before, um, you do learn a lot and you see what people are willing to it's beyond go the extra mile because it's not just in the job you have, but maybe something your university is asking you to do that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise, or to help out a coworker that, uh, like Kenny said, you used to be able to see that person in the office and see maybe if they were struggling. Now uh, you might be able to tell 
uh, their, their body language on a Zoom call or maybe a, a short email or text reply versus maybe something a little bit longer. So, so I think as, as we've learned all this, it, that's been the biggest, I think, takeaway for me. It's been managing a team of uh, varying ages of people from right out of college all the way up through my age and even a little bit older. If the culture is strong where you are, you find the great people to fit in. Then when you ask them to do the things that you didn't ever expect them to ask, then you can really, I think at that point, fully assess what's going on. And also, uh, we've had we, we've talked about the expectations here, then understand what really should be expected of them in a time like this. And I think that's the thing that when you notice, then it takes everything else, right? Your external messaging, none of that matters if the house isn't in order and everything isn't great. So it, it all starts there. And I think that's one of the things that I know we've seen at Mammoth in the Sun. Julie? Um, you know, like these guys have said, like, you know, let's, let's be real. You don't get into college athletics as long as we've all been here. If, if you think it's an eight to five job and it's going to be the same thing every day and it, you know, it'll be easy per se, but at the same time, we've talked about expectations a lot. Um, and, and at our level, all of us, it's, um, you know, the expectations are high. And when I think you get into something like this in a pandemic, there is a little bit of leeway that you have because there's there's so uncertainty and people understand that. But, um, you know, I think we're in this business to seek out the opportunity to just get better every single day. And I, I think we're going to find a lot of opportunities within this chaos. And, and if I can say anything to especially the younger people on this call, the things you're learning during this are going to be things that you're going to carry on for the rest of your career. And, you know, maybe it teaches you, you don't want to be in this career and that's okay. Um, you know, or, or maybe you want to be in a different department or whatever it may be, but, and that's all right. But at the same time, um, I think the things that um, our student athletes all the way up to our senior administrators have had to go to through and the resiliency that they've all shown, um, you know, I, I look forward to a year from now and seeing where we all are and, and seeing our mental health, you know, become more stable. And as you guys have said, I think it's making sure you take time to breathe yourself, but make sure your staff has that time too. And that you are, um, like Kenny said, just a simple something that you pass by in the hall, you got to notice it right now um, more than you have before to make sure that, that your staff is taken care of, you're transparent with what's going on and, and you're understanding that, that also there's things outside of, of the workplace. And uh, athletics is a very, difficult place sometimes to have a work-life balance and to understand how to do that. And, and I think um, like all you guys have said, when you're looking at, at places to work, you know, it, it's best to ask those questions and, and not be afraid to use your network to find out, you know, what these staffs are like, you know, and, and who you're going to be working with and things. But, you know, as, as frustrating as we might be right now, I think again, you know, just looking for those silver linings, and developing a relation, the relationships that you can um, is just really important right now and, and keeping that communication and, and those lines open is good. Let's send it out west with Clint. Uh, all awesome, you know, answers and things I wouldn't would just echo, but one thing I think is perspective. Um, this whole thing has put everything in perspective from obviously the COVID issue to um, social injustices that have gone on. Um, and then to, to friends and colleagues who've, you know, lost their job because of this, you know, just just to, over at BYU last week, we had seven people in their communications office let go. And and I'll tell you, knowing a lot of them, it hit us hard. So I, I think there's a certain perspective um, that I've learned from this. It's kind of a life changing, you know, even though I, I haven't been personally affected by COVID, it, it feels like, a, you know, a ch birth of a child or, you know, a marriage or a divorce, you know, it's such a life changing thing. And none of us will ever be the same again. So I think there's certainly a perspective we need to go in with things. Uh, like Julie said, we didn't get into this thinking this was going to be an eight to five thing. Um, and I'm actually kind of sick of having my, you know, Saturdays and Sundays. What do I do? Like I'm bored, right? So um, I, I I do know that I've, I've encouraged my staff to take time with their families, to go home at five o'clock, uh, to not worry about work on the weekends when we can. Um, but I think we're, we're getting to that point where I think we're back and ready. So, um, I, I'm personally ready to go, but I've learned a lot of perspective over these, these past few months. That's awesome. Uh, want to thank everyone, uh, for, for being with us today, Clint, Jessica, Eddie, Julie, Kenny, really great insight and discussion from everyone. Uh, a reminder that you can find this webinar, um, on demand later this afternoon on coastsided.com and on coastsided's YouTube channel as well. 
It'll also be put in a podcast form, and all links to that will be on Cosida.com's website, uh, and everything is free of charge. Some upcoming uh, webinars, as you can see on the screen, we've got uh, November 19th, the critical conversation, how, to, how communicators can become effective allies. That's at 2 p.m., and then next week we'll have our, on November 24th, our basketball game day media guidelines and hosting in the pandemic, a discussion with COSIDA and the USBWA. That's also at two o'clock. Uh, so for more details on that, on those webs, on the webinars, registration links, and to watch these previous sessions, please go to COSIDA.com slash professional development. A quick reminder that COSIDA.com's freelance uh, data, database page is available for people. Uh, people can access it directly at COSIDA.com slash freelance or under the career tab on COSIDA.com. We encourage everyone to request to be added to it. Uh, you don't need to be a member. Any freelance statistician or other game day personnel are welcome. There's no charge to be included on our freelance list. Want to thank everybody once again, and we'll be back with our next webinar on November 19th.